In my last video series, I showed you all how to build a more basic steam engine kit, such as this Bowser 280 here. Now, of course, there are many steam engine kits more advanced than these out there. So for this next video series I'm doing, I'll be building a more intermediate steam engine kit. This is another Bowser one. It's a Pennsylvania Railroad M1482. So let's get started. Bowser packages all their kits basically the same way. Instruction manual, same size box, foam padding all around. Got your boiler, main body up here, tender down here, motor, chassis, drive wheels, and then all the other parts in this box here. Now the detail set included with this is pretty basic. It gives you just the standard parts that you need to make a decent looking steam engine. But this is also one where they offered a super detail kit, which unfortunately is long gone and unavailable. However, most of the detail parts are still in production under the CalScale name, and a few of Bowser's own branded detail parts are still left. There were only a few that I wasn't able to acquire, so I'll likely be building them from scratch, but that will come uh, quite a bit later in the video series. Now, like with the last videos, I'll of course be starting with the chassis. So you've got these two parts here, and where the uh, 280 had a brass frame, this one is all die cast, nice and heavy. And then again, drive wheels, and these come with uh, pretty hefty bearings on them, which is nice. The two center ones are blind while only the front and rear drive wheels have flanges. And a DC-71 motor, same as the 280. And let's see, there are probably some parts in there I'll need. That's mostly details. It's a decal set. Digging down in here, there's the front truck, which I'll do after the rest of the drive system. And let's see, it looks like there are a few more details. Probably not any screws in here. Well, at least not for the chassis. Rear truck. Tender parts. Right, here we go. Side rod kit. So I'll be needing that. And let's see, there's uh, screws and other hardware. And then some of the valve gear parts and the usual um, valve gear riveting tool and um, driver for the uh, hex screws. And while the 280 was one of the oldest kits that Bowser offered using a repurposed Varney boiler, the M1 here is actually one of the newer ones that they offered with the uh, Parts that were developed mostly in the 80s, possibly the early 90s, but I think this is from the late 80s, and their quality was getting to be really excellent at this point. A detailed Bowser steam engine could easily rival brass. This one appears to be an older production, so most of the instructions are written instead of being in the PDF line art, but they do give plenty of reference material here, which is nice for all your detailing needs. And explode diagram here, there for the tender, but then the rest is written. Of course, they do make sure the directions are clear, so it's easy to understand. Now, of course, the first thing to do is file off any flash that may be on these die cast parts. And since the dies were pretty new when these were manufactured, there's very little to be found on here, so this should be a very quick and easy cleanup might be able to see there's just a little bit around the edges there, and that's really the most you're going to find around these newer parts. So just to gently go across that with the file, and that edge is already mostly clean. And then just keep up with that around the rest of the parts. 
All right, I've got just about everything filed off here. All that's left is a little bit in the gear slot. So I'll just go through there. That'll only took a couple minutes to finish. Now, of course, most of the frame here won't be visible on the finished model, but if there is any concern about anywhere you might see, just go over that, smooth it out a bit with some fine grit sandpaper. And that'll come out looking as nice as possible after you've done the painting later on. Now the bottom plate of the frame, it's interesting, this is actually an older casting from the rest of the chassis, so there's more flash to be filed off from here. I've already got it mostly cleaned up. Just take care of that little bit that's left in the axle slots. I think they originally developed this for another kit back in the maybe the late 60s, early 70s that time. Still a perfectly good part though. Just a little more cleaning to do. Get the stuff out of the hole there. You can drill that out or you can just go at it with a round file like that, which is really just as quick in most cases. Smooth that out. And it looks like that's now ready to use. As you finish each part, you might also want to check to make sure everything is sitting nice and flat. And it's kind of hard for me to picture a perfectly flat surface since I use this um, soft mat here. So I'm just using this metal weight I happen to have as a demonstration piece. And it looks like the chassis uh, mainframe is sitting nice and flat there. So that's good. And then the other piece here. Seems like it's not quite perfect. These die cast parts are kind of hard to bend without damaging though. So I might just have to put these parts together and make sure things fit flat with the wheels in place so it has good traction. And if there are any problems, I'll see what I can do with it. And real quick, before I do anything else, Bowser does recommend assembling the drawbar to the frame even before the drive wheels. So that's easy to put together on this one. And they came up with this nice wireless engine to tender drawbar design. So that uses a spring contact at each end. So there's this wire one that contacts the tender screw. And then for the steam engine frame end, it has this spring, a couple metal washers. But then with those metal washers goes these plastic insulators. So that's the first end puts together. Insert that into the hole. Might have to actually open up that hole a bit to fit that in place. So get out the round file. Now you don't want those insulators to have a loose fit, but at the same time, they shouldn't be so tight that they deform either. All right, so I have that hole opened up enough that you should still have a press fit into there, but it shouldn't be overly tight. Yeah, that went in. So now for the other end, take that other insulator down on there. It's not going down quite all the way, but tightening that with the uh, included nuts will finish that. Just thread that onto there. Now I'll grip that nut with either pliers like I'm doing or an appropriately sized wrench, which I don't have. Tighten the screw. And as that's tightening, it's pulling it all together. Now that's in place and ready. So the power will come from the tender go through the screw up to here, which will connect to the motor terminal. All right, so now we can get to looking at the drive wheels. Now, before I install these, I'll just go ahead and check the gauge real quick. I used to have an NMRI standards gauge on hand, but I seem to have lost that somewhere. 
but calipers still do just fine. So the spacing between wheels should ideally be 0.573, I believe it is. And that's 0.572, so that's excellent. Perfect. Or I was holding that at an angle, actually. There we go, got it straightened out, and it's actually perfect. So, no need for readjustment there. However, in case you ever do have to readjust the wheels, if you were need to have to pull them, then a tool like the Northwest Shortline Puller here is really, really helpful for that because all you have to do is just uh, unscrew that, stick the wheel in, and then if you need it to be pulled out a bit, you just tighten that down and it pulls the wheel off the axle. Now, if they were too wide, then what you could use instead is something like a bench vise with the wheels carefully placed inside and then just uh, carefully, very carefully, press the wheels a bit further on, checking their gauge to make sure they don't go on too far. Now also, the other thing that needs to be done is to check the grounding of the wheels. Easy way to do that, I believe I showed this in the last kit of Series 2, is to take um, two electrical terminals here, run a small amount of voltage through them, and see which one gives you short circuit. This one is the insulated wheel, and that one is the grounded wheel. Also, a lot of times on the insulated wheels, there will be a small strip of insulation visible somewhere between the um, tire and the wheel center. It's a little difficult to see on these wheels, but you can pick out just a little bit of that insulation right there, which in this case is black material. Also, one thing I just noticed and nearly forgot is that on some of these wheels, you may also want to check between the spokes for any possible flash. If you do see any, go in there with a the thin tool. We'll see if this knife works. Yeah, just uh, carefully, carefully trim that out. And then that looks a lot better. All right, the spokes are cleaned out, and I've got the grounded wheels figured out. And before I continue, I just remembered one more thing. So you may want to check the quartering of the drive wheels to make sure that they're correct. Now, you'd think this would be a given on any steam engine kit with a bunch of, with a bunch of Lynx drive wheels like this. But the fact is, I actually built a Tyco kit a few years back. It was the 440 General, and the wheels were turned to one-third instead of one-quarter, causing it to just lock up instead of actually running. So let's see if this will work. All right, so, yeah, Northwest Shortline does make a quartering tool which allows you to check the quartering, and I just attempted to do that here but forgot about these wheel bearings not fitting in there, unfortunately. Maybe I can turn things around in a way to make that work. Well, it doesn't look like these are going to fit. But usually with steam engine drive wheels, you can use a tool like this one to check the quartering of the wheels. You insert these crank pins into there, and then you would drop it into the slot, and then line these up with the 90 degree angle on each side to make sure the quartering is exactly how it should be. Fortunately, Bowser's always been very good about that in my experience. But one other thing you can do to check the quartering is if you really, really get things lined up straight here and get a good view of the crank pin holes, you can usually eyeball whether the quartering is where it needs to be or not. And this looks correct to me. So I think it's okay to continue with this. Now, had the quartering been off, um, what you would do in that case is to pull off one of the wheels from the axle and then find exactly where it needs to be to be quartered and then press it back on in that position. So now putting the wheels onto here, just kind of lining up the bearings with their slots there. 
Also making sure all the insulated wheels are on the same side. Since I have the frame upside down, I'm turning the axles around. So that way the grounded wheel is on the engineer side or right rail. Now the first time you put in these um, large bearing Bowser wheels, they may not seem like a very good fit. You can clean out the slots a little more to be sure, but you don't want to clean them too much because otherwise the fit may become loose and then it won't run correctly. So that takes one of these 256 screws here, just over a half inch long, or I think that's the one. It uses a flat head screw that mounts flush. Actually, it looks like there's a pretty good gap between those frame pieces, so I'm going to take this back apart and clean that up a bit more. So I'm just cleaning out the edges of these holes with a round file, or edges of these slots, just to make sure there's no excess in there that could be causing problems. Do the same for both parts. All right, so the fit still isn't perfect here, but there is a little trick to using these Bowser bearings, getting them aligned and seated. So what you do is you place a nut or other metal block on top like that, and then just give that a few hits while holding on to that. If that's not enough, then what I can do instead, put it onto this metal block. And I'm just a bit harder at it. You want to be careful here because you don't want to damage the chassis. But that is getting better. You don't want to damage the gear either. Just do that a little at a time at each end until all the wheels spin completely freely. Getting better. So a little more of this and I'll be able to tighten that plate on the rest of the way and have a super free rolling chassis. All right, now even before adding oil, all these drive wheels are spinning nice and free. So that'll make for a good free rolling chassis. And now that I know these are all rolling freely, I'll just put a little drop of oil into each of these bearings. And one nice thing about these is once you've seated the bearings completely the first time, the cover plate usually fits back on more easily and you shouldn't even have to do the seating again. But of course, if you do, it gets easier each time. Now the next thing the instructions say to do is to put the cylinders on, but I'm actually going to do the side rods instead, and just the main rods linking the wheels. So to start with these, um, these are usually pretty flat, but if you do see any bowing in them, like you can kind of see here, um, just uh, grip it gently like this, and bend it a little at a time. And as you go along, Check it on a flat block like this to make sure you didn't overdo it. Looks like I did a little too much there, so I'll just uh, bend it back that way. It's looking better. Needs just a little more. Okay, that's good. Check the other one, which is also bowed from the look of it, so into that one too. So these parts look especially clean, but there's still just a bit of flash that I can see in the holes there. So I'll take the round file, just real carefully turn that in there. Want to make sure these aren't rough because that'll put wear on the screws and cause binding. So now that one should be ready to install. I'll just do the same with the other one. All right, so now those should both be good to put on. So taking the chassis here, I'll just put that on its side. 
And let's see, these rods need to have the large metal hole on the second set of drivers. Just do that, and then these flat head screws fit into the holes there. So this screwdriver is just fitting, but it is a good idea to have a set of fine screwdrivers on hand, like a jeweler screwdrivers. That can really help a lot for putting small screws like these where they need to go. I've only linked two of the drive wheels so far. This actually makes it a bit easier to test things out. So instead of testing all of the wheels at once, you just add in one set of drivers at a time. So I'll install the side rod on the other side to the same wheels. Let's see how those turn on their own. Those feel like they're moving pretty freely. You also want to turn it by the geared wheel, the, the geared wheel. That one's the most important, just since that's the one that's moving the whole thing. Yeah, that feels pretty smooth. So now, add on the next set. And let's see, for this one, it uses a different screw from the rest. So that gets a piece of, that gets that little brass tube in there. And then, the small hex-headed screw that goes in there. Now, of course, for the hex-head screws, you'll want to use the driver for that. Let's see, that's the riveting tool. There, this is the hex driver in this case. Sometimes it's a screw, sometimes it's Something else like this. Let's just fit that over the head. Screw that in place. Okay. And now the other one. Brass tube. Screw. Tighten that in. And that's still turning well. I don't feel any binds in there. So now add on the last drive wheels. Now on some kits you have to do a bit more work here just since the holes in the side rods don't always line up a hundred percent with the wheels. But for high quality kits like these, usually you don't have those kinds of problems. Now, since this kit doesn't seem to have any problem with that, I can't really show you what to do if that problem comes up, but I may show that in another video if I get the opportunity. But it seems that all of the drive wheels are spinning nice and free with no binding. Okay, so add a bit of oil into each of those to make sure they are working as smoothly as possible. The oil I'm using here is a uh, um, ATF, that's a synthetic auto transmission fluid. Works nicely as a light, long-lasting oil. Of course other oils like uh, ones from Labelle are excellent. Yeah, that's feeling real nice there. Very free movement, free rolling. And you should be able to turn all the wheels from any point on here and be able to do it without any binding. And as long as that's all good, you can move on to the next step. So since I know the chassis rolls freely, now I'll get on to the side rods here. And these slider pins are made of steel, and I do see just a bit of rust on there, so 
I'm just gonna take my uh, fine grit sandpaper and just gently clean those off. You of course don't want these parts to be rusty since crossheads have to slide on them. You don't want to go at them with anything harsh like a file either. So fine grit sandpaper is about the harshest thing that you ever want to use on a part like this. Yeah, that looks better. So now the rest is just uh, cleaning these up to make sure that they sit flat on the chassis and don't have any nasty flash around them. And it looks like these are mostly clean around the sides. I'll just uh, move it back and forth a bit on the sandpaper here to make sure that's as clean, flat, and smooth as possible. Yeah, it looks like that is mostly flat, so just a little more sanding and that part will be ready. Just kind of turn to an angle here and there to make sure the edges stay nice and rounded. And then for flat areas, just use a file. And this metal feels softer than the rest of the kit, so this might be one of those white metal alloys, uh, sort of like a pewter. I don't think this is pewter, it's just a similar material. So when you're filing a soft material, material like this, you want to be a little more gentle. Make sure you don't leave any scratches in visible areas. other visible areas like this, I'll just go over that a bit with sandpaper. Well, that could actually use a little filing to take down the worst of it. And then I'll smooth it out with sandpaper. Yeah, the soft metal files down really quickly, so that's why you want to be gentle with it. These will have some detail parts going into the top, so um, the rest of that, whatever's left of that seam, shouldn't even be visible. So I'll just go around the rest of this the same way. All right, so with that cleaned up and looking good, now you want to test fit to the chassis. Hold that in place and make sure that it fits nice and flat. And using these uh, crosshead guides as a reference, it does appear that that setting about as perfectly level as it can get. So in that case, I can go ahead and screw that on. And if there are any changes in how flat it sits along the way, then I'll just pull it back off and file out this square bottom area until it sits correctly. These cylinders use the screws with the little uh, cheese heads on them. Leave both screws just a little bit loose so you can wiggle that around. Make sure that it's straight. So hold that straight and tighten the screws. Okay, so the cylinders are perpendicular on there. Crosshead guides are still flat and level. Looks like this one's curved inward just slightly. I'll pull out a little on it. There we go. And now the cylinders are installed. So that'll be all for this video. In the next one, I'll show how to assemble the rest of the side rods as well as the valve gear.